people of the United States. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hello and welcome to George Washington Slept Here, the civic education podcast from Freedom's Foundation at Valley Forge, where we explore American history, civics, and the idea of liberty through conversations with some of our favorite thinkers, writers, and leaders. I'm Jason Rea, Chief Operating Officer at Freedom's Foundation and host of George Washington Slept Here. The format is simple, a long-form conversation with a friend of Freedom's Foundation where everyone can learn something new. Before we go any further, a little housekeeping. We encourage everyone to subscribe to George Washington Slept Here wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure you get every new episode as soon as it is out. We love hearing from our listeners, so feel free to email us at gwshpodcast at gmail.com with your comments, questions, and suggestions, and hit us up at Freedoms Foundation social media at FFVF on Twitter and on Facebook and Instagram at Freedoms Foundation. Today's interview is with Victoria Coates, who is formerly of the U.S. Department of Energy and National Security Council and is currently at the Heritage Foundation. Our conversation today Today is going to be structured in a way to keep us on track. We want to explore your origin story. How did you become the person sitting here before us? We want to talk about your current work, including your books on art and art history. Then I want to talk about America today. Uh, Finally, we end with a quiz, which hopefully will allow our listeners to learn something about you that they did not know. So let's start. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I think being a Pennsylvanian is very much determinative of of my identity. On my mother's side, I'm descended from Andrew Greg Curtin, who was the governor of Pennsylvania during the Civil War. He's my great, great, great uncle uh, from Belfont, Pennsylvania. And on my father's side, I'm direct descendant of Hans Herr, who founded Lancaster County in the 17th century. So the roots are deep. Now I've raised my kids in Philadelphia and uh, I'm a very deeply committed Phillies, Eagles, Flyers, Sixers fan. Excellent. Also determinative of my identity would we'll be spending the weekend at the ballpark. So so that's really where, where my roots are. So you have obviously this connection to history and uh, particularly here in Pennsylvania, the Civil War, the founding of Lancaster County. Who were some of the influential people that, that, that really were formative for you when you were growing up? I think, you know, obviously start with my parents. Uh both of whom are, you know, lifelong committed sort of they're neither of them served in government, but are very committed to their communities and to volunteering, giving back. Uh, and so they obviously were a bedrock. I think about John Jarvis, who was the headmaster of the Lancaster Country Day School uh, for many, many years and formed my my early education uh, out there. And then my, my sibling, my brother, who has taken a radically different career path. He's in the financial services business, but whose, whose character and morals have always been a guiding light for me. It's, it's amazing those, how important those lessons uh, from our childhood, particularly when they're around volunteering or, or voting and, and participating in, in our system of government, that those lifelong lessons are, are so important. And, and when they're missing from a person's life, there are consequences to that. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's something, you know, we as a society are really grappling with is that, you know, the breakdown of the nuclear family. And we all you know, want to be very modern and, and think that maybe that's, that's a, a, a something of the past. But as we are looking at some of the crises that we're facing, particularly with young people and their lack of, of personal identity and sense of self-worth, and what what that is doing to the generation, particularly those who particularly suffered under under COVID, I think we you know we're due to it for a really serious reassessment of how we are supporting and encouraging thriving families to create a a more a more grounded populace. Absolutely. So you're grow up in Lancaster, Lancaster Country Day, and then you decide you're going to go to Trinity College in Connecticut and study art history. And I'm curious about how you came to that place um, and, and, and why art history and, and why Connecticut? 
Trinity, I chose because I wanted a small liberal arts college, and I had a good friend who went there and was having a wonderful experience. And so that's what I hit on, was a, determined to be a political science major in my freshman year, uh, did a lot of work on on that major. And my father, who had gone to Harvard in the 50s uh, and had, had actually wanted to be an art history major, he'd studied 17th century Dutch art with Seymour Slive, was trying to tr- sort of basically trick me into taking art history. <laughs> <laughs> so he, I remember he said to me one day, it's good for crossword puzzles. And, that, and so that, that lured me in. And what I found was it, it – the discipline plays into the way my my mind works. I have a trick memory for name states and and images, and I, I I associate those very naturally. And we actually had a very bad situation that that fall at Trinity. The wonderful tenured professor, who usually taught the first half of our survey, was was on sabbatical, and they had a, a truly awful replacement professor. And I think I went to class three times, but was mesmerized by the textbook and did extremely well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So by the time we got to the second semester and I had the professor who became my advisor, you know, we were we were off to the races. And then I went to Rome that fall with Trinity's program and it was all over. Yeah. Uh, so I, I completely get it. I had, I took a, a art history class early on and the, uh, our professor was also a curator at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And uh, much of the classical department had his name on it of things that he had been on digs and discovered and, and then donated uh, to the collection and his passion for the subject, but also the fact that he was not just an academic, but was actually in field in a museum as a curator, I, I learned so much about and, and learned that, oh, th- these are things I need to know more about. And part of it is that that connection to Western civilization, what we uh, what we understand as this shared history that plays out. And so y- you not only studied art history, you went on to get your master's degree and then your PhD and you came back to Penn for your PhD in, in art history, and but you've also got this political science and, you know, the idea. So tell me how, once you had your PhD, I know you end up with Donald Rumsfeld <laughs> and doing uh, research for him. Talk to us a little bit about that and how you got there. Yeah, it all makes perfect sense. And so, you know, with, with art history, you can't really do much without a PhD, Back in the day, you you could probably do some curatorial work, with masters, but more and more the PhD is just required. So I knew that's what I wanted, so did it straight out of college, and uh, was sort of all on my way to doing the fairly standard academic career. Uh, when we had our children, I was adjunct at Penn, which was a great a great gig to be able to keep teaching. I had a lot of support out of the university and raise the children in a somewhat normal fashion, and was getting into a project regarding uh, the reception of Pompeii, of all things, which grew from a small show at Penn to a much larger show out at the Getty Villa with an extended, extensive catalog, uh, and sort of felt like I was you know, establishing myself and, and thinking it was time to look for a tenure-track job. In post-9-11 academia, things became increasingly sort of politically toxic Mm. and where, you know, pre-9-11, pre-2000 election, you know, there there was always a liberal majority, but it was not so dominant that conservative voices were seen as isolated and and deeply suspect. Mm-hmm. And when you're hiring for a tenure track position, you're hiring for tw- you know 20 years. You're going to sure. have this person around the faculty lounge. You do look at personalities, and you want people who you think are agreeable and interesting, and and have similar views. And so you wind up with a situation where the 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 views of the tenured faculty are including increasingly homogenous, and there is no room for dissent. And I think that's how we've gotten where we are in academia now. Where there, you know, there's kind of one monolithic view, and anybody who disagrees causes massive outrage. So I think, you know, for me, as I as was going through that period of time, I, I just I was a little bit uncomfortable with with the with the culture in academia. But it, it's what I had always wanted. So 
when Rumsfeld retired and I had a connection through some of his speechwriters to his office and, and they reached out and, and said, do you know any academics who could help him with this book? He's got a lot of archival material. I did not know then the extent of it. I probably would have run screaming had I known <laughs> what a pack rat that man was. You know, I remember going up to my husband's office and saying, this is so unfortunate that no one I know will help him with this project. And George looked at me and said, well, why don't you do it? And I said, I can't. You know, I'm teaching in the fall. And he was like, yeah, you're teaching at Penn. Your first book is coming out in a couple of months from, you know, from the Getty. Is this the next 20 years? And I said, I don't think it is. He said, it isn't. Call him back. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and it, it, and it then happened very quickly, not particularly orderly fashion after that. So that was how the swerve was made. So I want to um, I want to put a pen in the uh, college uh, faculty and because I think that's going to lead us to this conversation because I think that's emblematic of much of what's going on in America today. But I, I want to know more. Donald and, and Mrs. Rumsfeld were, were supporters of Freedoms Foundation. They were we never got to have them here. Uh, we were working on it when when he passed. But just tell us a little bit about that interaction and because you were you know, you were there at the end of his career. He's been Secretary of Defense. He's been been intimately involved in several administrations. A world of experience that very few have anything similar. And and you're there helping him assemble his memoir. No, it was it was really the honor of a lifetime, and you know, such an incredible American story, which he was very conscious of of what he had lived, and he would frequently say, you know, I've lived a third of America's history over the course of of my life, and I refer to it as my second PhD, working for him for four years, you know, in a primary source environment. Certainly, very humbling as a scholar to be able to consult with your principal. And, and have all of these documents. And it, it was really very, very visionary about it. We, we digitized the entire archive, most of which is deposited at the Library of Congress on loan, uh, which he started doing in the 70s after he was secretary the first time. But then there are other deposits of papers. He had some, some personal papers, although he got those over to the libraries in a very orderly fashion. So actually, I know a lot about the current document scandals about how these things are actually managed. But there are papers at the Pentagon, obviously. There are things at the National Archives. Uh, they're both classified and unclassified. So a very complex archive, uh, but a wonderfully rich one that allowed us to go back to you know, his career in Congress. And one thing he did, which I actually inf inform all of my friends in Congress that they should do, is after he voted on something, he would come out and, and dictate into a, a dictaphone why he had voted as he did. Uh -huh. So he's recording that for posterity as it's happening. And for his own records, because mm -hmm. there was a situation where he he voted against funding for, uh, for the Library of Congress because in that funding bill, they also included funding for a new parking garage for the Congress, a new swimming pool for the Congress, a whole bunch of fat, fat the, pork the, for the Congress. The, the famous paperclip that the Simpsons episode yes. talks about. <laughs> and and it did also interesting for the debates we're going to have this year on, on funding for various things that get attached to much, must pass. Mm -hmm. And he then got attacked in his next uh, election for voting against the Library of Congress. Why do you hate books, Congressman Rumsfeld? Right. And he said, I don't hate books, but I hate pork. Right. And he had that right there. Uh, and so, so that was amazing. When he was chief of staff to Gerald Ford, he kept similar kind of running memos through the day, which he actually used to communicate with his deputy, who was Dick Cheney. Uh, so it would be a line of, you know, do this, do that, and then Dick in capital letters. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> and I was showing one to Mr. Cheney one day, and he was just almost shaking. He said those things used to land on my desk like a ton of bricks. <laughs> uh, and so that, and then the very famous snowflakes from 2001 to 2006, uh, which he used to communicate with with his both with his immediate staff, but then more broadly across the Bush administration. I had somebody ask me the other day if I knew what was behind a particular snowflake. I said no. My, so, I don't know. <laughs> explain what the snowflake is for those who it's, may not know. It's just a small short memo on something that's on his mind. Uh, I mean, one, so out of nowhere, this might come. Yeah. Like 
we need to do, you know, to Doug Fife, we need to do something about North Korea. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. this was a signal to Doug to initiate a process on North Korea policy. But then he'd follow up and follow up and okay. remind you that you had not yet responded. So it was a way to both uh, cre- create a work stream and then measure its progress. Okay. Okay. So I, I just remember, and we do not need to uh, rehearse uh, the, the pros and cons of, of Iraq and what happened there. But I do remember Secretary Rumsfeld having that nighttime satellite photo of North Korea and talking about or the Korean Peninsula. Mm-hmm. But you've got just one spot of, of light in Pyongyang in the north. And then you've got just the entire southern peninsula in South Korea and him contextualizing that this is what the Korean War resulted in is this great opportunity. And it took 40 years or more to happen in South Korea. But this is what the American military and, and the United Nations gave to the people of South Korea. And and he felt like we, we had the opportunity to do something similar in Iraq. And it hasn't necessarily worked out maybe that way, but we also don't know because it, that's a very slow process. But I just remember that that was, I'd never thought of it in those terms before. And it's just so very stark when you see that satellite photo. It is. And the pic- the picture's in the book. Uh, and uh, it, it you know, the, the contrast between the darkness and the oppression of the North and the just bright light and opportunity, as you say, in the South, I mean, it's literally a line. And I think it's instructive for, for what we're confronting in 2023, because there there's a a proposal being floated to do something similar in Ukraine to create mm-hmm. a frozen conflict. And that's okay for the people on the south of the border, but bear in mind in North Korea, exactly the same people, the same DNA on the north of the border are living under just hideous oppression and terrible, terrible, unnecessary conditions. And it just, I'd hate to see something like that happen, happen to the people of, of eastern Ukraine. So I, I think that's a cautionary tale um, as well. I, I absolutely think you're right. So from Rumsfeld, how do you wind up uh, in the White House doing national security work? Well, I blame Ted Cruz. Okay. Uh, so so post Rumsfeld, I've thought I would just go back to academia, got working on, on my book on David Sling. Uh, my husband was doing a lot of work travel, so I got to play Play wife and mother for a period of time, which I quite enjoyed. I uh, worked a little bit as a consultant for Governor Perry on his uh, 2012 presidential campaign and remained active in his office after that and sort of thought that was what, what the future held for me. And a friend of mine got elected to the Senate somewhat unexpectedly in 2012 uh, and named as his first chief of staff a, a guy named Chip Roy, who I had worked with in, in Governor Perry's office. And Chip called me one day in January of 13 and said, will you come down and help us with the Hegel and Kerry nominations for DOD and state? Uh, Because Senator, then Senator Cruz, brand new Senator Cruz, was not intending to do a ton on national security policy, you know, needed somebody to just manage these, these nominations. I said, sure, I'll come down for two weeks. (laughs) <laughs> Take a bite out of John Kerry. I don't mind doing that. Uh, and we just had an incredible time. And, you know, Ted was off to the races from day one in the Senate and just in the middle of all the most interesting and exciting fights and was became deeply interested in national security policy. At that point, we were on armed services. He's now on foreign relations playing a, a really outside role, but we had a, a really interesting time during those years sort of crafting a new national security policy that was neither purely libertarian nor Republican establishment. So if you think about, you know, John McCain and Rand Paul being the two sort of polar Right. Uh, You've got in, in Rand yeah. Paul and Libertarians, you have the isolationist withdrawal. And in and, and McCain, you've got sort of the world's policeman. Right, and, exactly. And so those are the two poles. And, and so then it's a matter of, you know, is there a way to navigate a, a middle path somewhere? There is. And, and and I kind of resist the the middle of the road because one of Rumsfeld's sayings was the only thing you're going to find in the middle of the road are double lines and dead squirrels. Uh, <laughs> so I, I tend to think of this more as a, another point on the triangle, that this is, this is a, a position, you know, that – 
that Ted and I thought about very seriously. And, you know, when when he and then President-elect Trump decided to make peace with each other and, and he offered whatever staff he could, I, I wound up in that deal, but had no trouble uh, in terms of policy working for President Trump because a lot of the policies were very similar mm -hmm. to, to what Senator Cruz had worked on. As a matter of fact, I remember John Bolton actually making fun of me at one point because he said every time we do something, the legislation, you know, Cruz is the lead sponsor of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so there there wasn't much of a policy difference there. So it was very easy to make the shift to the Trump administration. So when you were working, when you had shifted to the Trump administration, mm -hmm. were working on National Security Council, John Bolton, was was he the National Security Advisor at that point? I or? actually worked for all four of them. Mike, okay. Mike Flynn hired me uh, because we had known General Flynn when he was uh, the head of the Defense and Intelligence Agency, and he would come brief Senator Cruz and me. And so Mike was the original point of contact. Uh, he was in office for, I think, 28 days. We got to go through another transition right. to General McMaster, uh, who was in, in the position for about a year, uh, remains a very dear friend. Uh, and then Ambassador Bolton came in for a little over a year, and then Robert O'Brien. Mm, okay. And then, uh, so eventually you're, if I have my notes right, uh, Deputy National Security Advisor for Middle East and North African Affairs. So let's talk about the Middle East and North Africa and, and give us a quick primer on um, what we need to know. I know one of the things that... Um, uh, you know, just historically, and you are a trained historian, um, you know, the, the Middle East, you have to go back to at least the end of World War I because it, it transforms the Middle East and draws boundaries that never existed historically. And, and we continue to reap the whirlwind today more than a century later. No, I, th I think I think you're 100 percent accurate there. It's a, it's a fascinating part of the world where you have, you know, both you know, abject, grinding poverty, enormous wealth. Uh, it was very extreme, like weather conditions. There's either it's desert or it's jungle, uh, and then just enormous natural resources, uh, which are what generate a lot of a lot of the wealth. And it's it's in the kind of nexus point between east and west. Uh, massive amounts of the world's shipping go through go through the region. Uh, you'll have choke points like the Suez Canal, Baba Manda, the Strait of Hormuz, which become uh, hugely strategic. You have the introduction of Israel after World War II, uh, the modern state of Israel, uh, and, and all that that has, ha the conflict that has caused, but now in 2023, the opportunities it is creating, which are, are quite extraordinary. So, you know, historically speaking, it is one of the most interesting places in the world. The United States has been very engaged in the Middle East over the last century with various degrees of success, uh, which has created some fatigue among a lot of certain areas of the U.S. population who want to sort of stay out of Middle East wars, which I certainly agree with. Uh, but we can't pivot away from it. That is a popular refrain that we need to pay attention to China. Strongly agree with that. We do. But guess who's active in the Middle East? China. China is importing vast amounts of energy, uh, particularly from the Gulf. Uh, and, you know, we are no longer an energy importer uh, as the United States. We're actually, we uh, can be a, an exporter and we're the world's largest energy producer. So we're in a very different place mm -hmm. with the Middle East than we were in in say the 1980s where we were very dependent on it and but again that doesn't mean we should we should turn away from it because if we want to compete with China we should leverage our historic security relationships with countries like Saudi Arabia in order to make clear to China you know we're we're fine with you buying as much market valued oil as you would like from Saudi Arabia but you know guess who has the fifth fleet in the gulf mm -hmm. you don't we mm -hmm. do and so I think that is a very powerful sort of point of leverage for us to potentially uh, encourage better behavior out of out of the PRC. Abraham Accords, you had a, you had a hand in those. You were you were part of that. I'm I you know it is historic. I mean, in, in truly to um, and and quite frankly, um, for whatever criticisms I may have of 
President Trump, I think it is one of his, you know, uh, great accomplishments was uh, uh, to pull off these this, you know, historic agreement between Israel and, and Saudi Arabia. Um, well, UAE. The, the UAE. Are, sorry. Thank Sa you. Saudis, we're hopeful. Yes. Um, tell us about the, how that came about and, and, and what you are, you speak of, of hopeful. Um, you know, the, is that a template um, for the future uh, for the rest of the region? It's really a wonderful episode in terms of encouraging flexible thinking. If you will, uh, I had been working with Jason Greenblatt and Jared Kushner on what the president originally wanted to do, which was broker a peace deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians, which he referred to as the deal of the century. And we did labor at that mightily for a year and came up with actually a pretty reasonable plan, which would be enormously to the benefit of the Palestinian people. Unfortunately, their leadership, uh, for various reasons, simply would not engage on it. And at some point, it became pretty clear over the course of the summer of 2019 that <laughs> UAE and Bahrain in particular were sort of over the whole thing, the Palestinian mm -hmm. issue. They had tried so hard to, you know, to, to be constructive partners to the Palestinians who just insisted on, you know, having a veto over any engagement with the Israelis. And, and finally, and this great credit to both the, the Crown Prince of Bahrain and, and the, the then Crown Prince of, of UAE, Mohammed bin Zayed, that, that they just, they said enough and we're gonna do this. And the, the Israelis kind of made the first offer, which was basically let's pledge to not attack each other. Uh, but that's, they, that's, that's a good place to it's start. A, it's a start, but but they weren't planning on attacking each other. And so then it sort of became, well, what else can we do? And establishing close economic ties and some other uh, some other points of contact was developed over the course of, of 2020 then. Uh, and I was living in Abu Dhabi. It was COVID year. And I was I was actually supposed to be the Secretary of Energy's regional envoy. But it was very hard to move around. But sure. I managed to get myself to Abu Dhabi for seven weeks and work on energy issues and support the progress on the accords. Uh, and then got to go to Riyadh for seven weeks in the fall of that year. So it was a little different than the planned experience, but an incredible experience at the same time. So you have, at this point, you've spent significant time in government, but and and doing policy and and I guess to a lesser extent politics. But there's always where there's policy, oh, there's, there's politics. Hackery in yeah. There. yeah. But you never lose sight of of art history, and so I want to talk about David Sling mm -hmm. because it is so right up my alley. And and the uh, uh, the subtitle is a history of democracy in ten works of art. And I uh, just got my copy and have started reading it. And it's there'll uh, be a I, quiz. I love it. But I want you to tell the story of Brutus. Uh, it's one of the, the the first. I think the first piece you start with. Uh, the Parthenon um, is actually the Parthenon's part. Yeah. That's right. I, I skipped the Parthenon, went right to Brutus because the story of Brutus mm -hmm. um, is the story of the Roman Republic. And um, for our founders, um, the story of the Ro Roman Republic is just fundamental to what they did here during the American Revolution and, and at the, the Philadelphia Convention. So, so tell us the story of Brutus. It really is, and and the the structure of David Sling is that there there are these ten works of art going from the Parthenon to Picasso's Guernica, each of which was created and understood to be a commemoration of a free system. Uh, obviously, the democracy in Athens, the Republic in Rome, and then we go through Venice and Florence and Holland and. France turns up twice because they struggled. They had a hard time. Uh, Great Britain and the United States. Uh, so, so a really interesting exercise in, in letting a single work of art kind of lead you through the history uh, of a democracy. And the argument certainly is not that only democracies produce great art. It's in many ways, it's remarkable that democracies produce anything at all. Mm. Uh, you know, in the church and empire traditionally are the sources of, of great patronage of, of works of art, but that these 10 pieces uh, were really understood by those who created them to be celebrations of, of human freedom. And in, in terms of, of the Brutus, there, just remember there are two Bruti. There's the first, Lucius Junius, 
Brutus and then the second who stabs Julius Caesar, they're separated by several hundred years, but part of the same, uh, same family. And the first Brutus uh, was instrumental in, in founding the Roman Republic, in kicking out uh, the, the kings of Rome, establishing a republic, and he did it at just tremendous personal cost, uh, both in terms of, of fighting the battles to, to rid Rome of despots, but then... And they wanted him to be the next king. They wanted him to be the king. <laughs> right. That, that it, you know, it, so was he always thinking he wanted something other than a kingdom? You know, short answer there is I don't know, but, mm. but he seems to have been at least as he's portrayed in history, committed to a free state for Rome. And, and yeah. And, and and his, you know, and of course, this uh, eventually costs him his sons. This is the great act of, of sacrifice on which the Roman Republic is, is truly founded in that uh, Brutus's sons start to collude with the descendants of, of the kings who are their cousins to bring the monarchy back. And this is uncovered, and Brutus has to order their execution, which he does. And there, the, sort of his, the history tells us there's this dramatic moment after the execution when the people of Rome are trying to celebrate his heroic action. And he says, no, I'm just a bereaved father, and I'm going home to mourn, wait for the bodies of mm-hmm. my sons. And, you know, this, this powerful uh, just example of self-sacrifice for the greater good, you know, becomes the founding myth, really, of, of the Roman Republic. And at some point during the early Republican period, this bronze uh, portrait is, is cast that is known as the Brutus. Portraiture is really invented by the Romans. It didn't exist in terms of recording an individual uh, portraiture in ancient Egypt, Greece, Mesopotamia is all very highly idealized uh, and and regularized. Everyone kind of looks the same. Uh, but the Romans decided for the first time they wanted to to record individual features, which is in many ways a, a instructive topic for us in our selfie world. Uh, <laughs> they did not develop self-portraiture. That was the Renaissance, which is another issue. But uh, but they did develop the individual portrait and this this bronze uh, of Brutus, which is now in the Capitoline Museum in Rome, is, is just, it, it's like a roadmap of self-sacrifice. You look at this very gaunt, weathered face, intense expression and concentration and just get a real sense of the psychology of the individual, of the sitter. Uh, and that for, for Brutus, recording his features as they were uh, is his badge of honor rather than trying to idealize him or airbrush him, we might say. And this was one of the pieces of art that Napoleon Bonaparte specifically wants from the Pope when, uh, is it Sixtus, who he defeats before he becomes emperor. But he brings... On his way. Yes, on his way, on the road. He, they still are nominally a republic uh, in France, but I would say they're not. But this is a piece, this mm-hmm. Brutus bust uh, he brings to Paris. He does. And Napoleon turns up, I think, six times in David's sling. He's like an evil pixie. He's always sort of <laughs> showing up and stealing the works of art. Uh, he's deeply interested in art and understanding its value. And, and when he conquers Italy, uh, you know, one of the things he does is take back just massive amounts uh, of art um, from Rome, Venice, Florence, and puts it all in the Louvre and creates this kind of mega museum. And he had an artist in his retinue uh, – named David, who had actually been a great part of the revolution, but then became Napoleon's state artist. He was flexible politically. Right. Those who have been to Versailles have seen he does the mm-hmm. the crowning mm-hmm. when, when Napoleon is crowning himself, and it's a, just a massive work. I remember yeah. seeing that at 16 years old and yeah. thinking, this is, you know, I've never seen yeah. such a large painting. He's, he's incredible. Uh, David is as an artist, but uh, David, in his early years in Rome, had had painted uh, an image of Brutus uh, of Brutus waiting for the bodies of his sons and used the Capitoline Brutus, which had been recovered in the 16th century, actually on the Capitoline Hill when Michelangelo was doing his intervention architecturally there uh, and had become this this celebrity object and and Napoleon brings it back. Uh, so And then 
talks to David about it and and they use it for various things, but it, it it's actually kept in in Napoleon's personal apartment. So it's something he he felt very powerful. And about. as they were waiting for it, I think the quote that you have mm-hmm. of Napoleon, he says to David, he goes, "We will soon see whether your your copy is mm-hmm. as good as, as the original." Exactly. Yeah. So th- you have a couple of uh, of uh, quotes from the introduction that that really caught me because I think they speak to what Freedom's Foundation is about and what we do. Um, Um, And you talked about the synergy between liberty and creativity and that liberty inspires ingenuity. And so, you know, liberty is at the heart of everything we do. It's in our title. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and, uh, you know, uh, whether it's teacher programs like we have, uh, like we're in the midst of this summer or our student programs, um, we're always trying to uh, show to them the what it means to live in a place where liberty is the rule and not the exception. Um, And the need to appreciate that, the need to defend that, the need to um, pass it on to the next generation. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about what you see as, and, and what David Sling talks about as this connection between liberty and creativity and ingenuity and, and what, what, what that means. Well, it really goes to the title of the book uh, because the, the the central chapter is about Michelangelo's David, uh, which uh, most people don't know about Michelangelo, but he was a highly politicized individual, the deeply interested in the Florentine Republic, uh, like David, had some flexibility, also worked for the Medici family, which eventually under, undermined the Florentine Republic, but was a committed Florentine patriot. And the, the David is actually commissioned by the reconstituted uh, republic after the Medici had been kicked out in the 1490s. And the contract is signed the same week they unveil their new constitution. There's a very clear connection between the establishment of that republic and the creation of the statue as its uh, figurative defender. And as I was working on the uh, on the book and trying to think of a title, it occurred to me, you know, most look at the David and focus on the right hand, uh, the sort of outsized hand, which is seen as as an allegory for the hand of Michelangelo, the creator. But it occurred to me that the biblical hero David, if he hadn't had the sling, would have lost that battle. Mm-hmm. The sling, the artificial thing, which maximizes his power, which allows him to stun Goliath and then chop his head off, uh, that the sling is what does it. And for humans, freedom has been that sling, has been that thing that has allowed us to kind of catapult ourselves into something bigger than what we are. And I think as as Americans, it has really been defining to us. And it's something that we continue to debate hotly today. And I think that's so important that we don't take liberty for granted. We don't assume it is, is our natural state. It is not. Given our, you know, if we just sort of leave ourselves to our own natural devices, we will very quickly, I think, descend into tyranny because tyranny is easy. It's easier to give somebody else control, to not have to exercise free will, to not have to make decisions, to not be held responsible for your actions. Uh, so, So the fact that we've been able to maintain our liberty and enhance our liberty over the course of now getting on 250 years is is enormously important. And I think that's why the work that you do out here, I think very appropriately at Valley Forge, is so critical to both remind us of that legacy, but then continue the the fight going forward and not, and as I, as I said, take it for granted. You quote uh, what is one of my all-time favorite um, quotes uh, from Churchill uh, about democracy and where it ranks in systems of government. <laughs> the worst except for all the others ever tried. Uh, you know, and Churchill was obviously someone who who tangled very directly with democracy and and felt both its benefits and its punishments. And I think he understood very very clearly uh, from from a British perspective what what the transition from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy had meant for the British people. And so the object I use for for the Brits is actually the Elgin Marbles, which was fairly controversial since they were originally part of the Parthenon, but as they were brought back to to 
the UK in the early 19th century by Lord Elgin and then installed in the British Museum, they, they are now a profoundly British object. If they ship them back and stick them back on the Parthenon or put them in the Parthenon Museum, whatever they do, you know, that, that will no longer be the case. But as they stand right now, they're really a monument for, to what uh, Churchill you know, fought so valiantly for in, in World War II. This idea of the inefficiencies of democracy are one of the things that comes up again and again in polls of of younger people, millennials and Gen Z, and I have two of them under at home. under forty, where there is this there is this willingness to allow for what we would call authoritarian government if it gives them the policies that they think they want. And yet I think people like you and I know that you might get that in this policy, but you are likely to not appreciate these policies over here that, and it all comes as a package deal. No, I think, I think that's very true. And again, it's why your work is so important to, you know, contribute to the education of, of young people so they do understand, you know, the gifts that that they're being given. And working in government, uh, particularly in, in international uh, affairs, you know, there, there is a great deal of frustration around the globe about the habit the United States has of changing administrations every four to eight years. And that, you know, there's always intense curiosity about what an incoming administration might do or not do concerns that things are being reversed. And, you know, what I tell them is that, you know, the constant presence, the thing you can always depend on is the Congress. That's always going to be there. And so if you want to create some kind of lasting deal with an administration, you have to go through the Congress. You're going to have to pass that thing as a treaty. Uh, and then it will be binding on successive presidents. But if you don't do that, yes, that can be changed in four or eight years time. And it's, very hard for some some to wrap their heads around, but it's it's also a great strength that present, prevents us from being hugely predictable. It allows us flexibility going forward, and so I do think it is beholden on us to to open the eyes of these younger generations to to the gift of freedom and to what that then poses or presents to them as opportunities that that they can. They can choose to, you know, live in their mother's basement and stay in their pajamas, or they can choose to go find, fund, or, uh, found rather Tesla and SpaceX, and that's the opportunity that will be given to them. I think that leads us nicely to uh, further sort of explore what is a, a, a occupational concern for all of us here at Freedoms Foundation, which is what we talk about political polarization, that the inability of Americans to agree on much. It seems everything is like the Senate split on the, the narrowest of you know majorities, if there is a majority at all. And so I'm, I'm curious, as someone who has both looked at, at history and the history of liberty in, through art, but also been in, in policy and politics, how, how do we begin to find ways to at least address one another and find our way to... I, I, my biggest concern is that if you don't agree with me, then we're enemies. Right. There's kind of a moral judgment that's crept into it, which I find deeply troubling, that, that disagreement can't happen in good faith right now. It, it, it's, you are, you're, not just, you just, you, you're not just mistaken, you're evil. Uh, and I think we're losing sight of everybody's common humanity. And that's where the study of history, I think, is, is instructive. Uh, but then also getting to know people like Secretary Rumsfeld or Senator Cruz, uh, that that you know these are individual humans you know with their faults and and foibles like everybody else but have have managed to you know to rise above many of their own personal challenges to achieve some fairly extraordinary things and that's what you know you look at in the past that you know figures from Brutus to Michelangelo to uh, to Churchill you know that not that they were superhuman or somehow greater than we were are. There weren't, but but that they they were able to to face their own challenges and and do something bigger than themselves, and you know that we all have that in us 
and that that we all have you know good and evil in us but but that the good outweighs it and trying to find that in individuals uh is something that that I don't think enough people are doing now and that that there is a a very dramatic kind of rush to judgment that if you if you don't do X and you, know, you find it on environmental issues all the time like mm-hmm. if you're not if you're not pursuing net zero by 2050 regardless of its costs to humanity you know you are a bad evil person right and that you know trying to reverse you know in my work that that sort of debate or that construct and say, wait, no, we can talk about, you know, we, we can all agree that we want to get to a better environment. Everybody thinks that. I don't know anybody who wants a dirtier environment. Uh, but there, there are different ways to get there. And asking those questions and presenting alternative views does not make you, you know, the, the underminer of humanity. It can make you the champion of humanity. So, you know, I just try to take the heat out of these debates. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't want to yell at people. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't thrive on on conflict or friction. And you know, just try to ask, you know, why do you think this? You know, what what's the what's the data? What's the evidence that leads you to this conclusion? And have you thought about this? And just try to, you know, try to take maybe what you'd call a more so- Socratic method. Uh, get back to the ancient Greeks. I think uh, you're exactly right. I, I want to come back to the point you were making earlier about academia and the monolith that has. And I thought it was interesting that you you sort of date it at 9-11 as that, that there, there's something that fundamentally changes. And maybe that's a part and parcel with Iraq and Afghanistan mm-hmm. and, and now this what has seem to be a splintering of of any kind of agreement and so academia i think there are lots there are more and more monoliths and it's it's part of what you're you're talking about that it's like you either agree with me fully or we can't agree on anything and and there there's less and less coalition mm-hmm. building and i would say compromise you know the 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 what was maybe the greatest achievement of the founding fathers was their ability to compromise and and sometimes they were awful compromises, Mm -hmm. but they were for greater good. And that seems to be less and less possible today. I I think what happened is we start to gain some sort of historical perspective on the turn of the millennium. Uh, You know, the 2000 election, we forget how incredibly bitter that was. And requires the Supreme Court to to come in and settle it in in Gore v. Bush. And, And that, I mean, that was, I remember those brutal months or weeks rather, in between the election and the final resolution. Uh, and, you know, half the country, uh, this sort of has interesting echoes for our own time, was firmly convinced the election was stolen. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what would have happened, but we had 9-11. And you had that half of the country, as we all did, come together because we had been attacked. And, you know, they decided they would support George W. Bush uh, and and did. And then I think that group felt very betrayed by then what happened, particularly uh, with with the war in Iraq. And it was then when you feel betrayed, you feel like you've you've done this generous thing by coming to support this president that you had virulently opposed and thought was illegitimate. And then he turned around and and done this thing you really disagreed with. Uh, And I think that's, that's where the sort of current crop of polarization started to fester. And (laughs) In many ways, President Trump came along and poured gasoline on it and set it on fire, <laughs> uh, as is his special gift. But it it's you know it, it is a very difficult position to find ourselves in in now. Uh, I don't I don't know that what's going to happen in twenty four is going to heal it, but I have great confidence that we will get to that that national healing. I'm 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 always happy to meet someone who is an optimist, and uh, because I I like to be an optimist. And uh, but I always, you know, but periodically I just have these moments like, are we Rome? Are we, you know, on the decline? And uh, and and I'm not convinced there's enough evidence that says we are. But there are just some moments where it's like, okay, this just means the work we're doing with young people is even more important. 
and maybe more important than it's ever been. Oh, I think that absolutely that is that is true. And bear in mind, Rome did go on for 500 years. That's true. And they, <laughs> and they as a republic, and then went on a lot longer as an empire. But their problem was is they kept going on foreign adventures and gathering more territory, which became uncomfortable with their original construct. Uh, and I don't think we're doing that. So I think we're good there. And also, again, history can be enormously instructive. Uh, the American chapter in the book actually focuses on uh, the Civil War. And I, I had originally thought I was going to use Washington crossing the Delaware and, and focus on that painting, which does play mm -hmm. a very large role in the in the chapter, but wound up. I'm actually you know, in a in a couple of weeks, my my godsons are coming to visit from Texas and I'm taking them to New York and we're going to go see that painting. Well, they're going to have to read the chapter because the Beardstadt, which is the focus of the chapter, hangs in that gallery. Mm -hmm. And the gallery is important uh, and, and does play a role in in the chapter. But. If you think about what we went through in the Civil War, I mean, talk about division and it just ghastly bloodshed. And this great, great, great uncle of mine was governor during uh, during Gettysburg and, you know, walked the fields afterwards. And, you know, there I think there are still areas in in Gettysburg, which are like the Zone Rouge in France that you, you couldn't farm today mm. uh, because of of what happened there. And. You know, if, if we could survive that, you know, if we could survive two world wars, you think about just the, the ghastly events of the 1960s and 70s, the, you know, the assassinations, Vietnam, uh, just, you know, terrible, terrible social divisions, terrible economic troubles for the nation and come out of that and win the Cold War. You know, right. this should give us tremendous hope that maybe things aren't so bad right now. Uh, they've been worse before. We've made it. We can do this. We just need to keep focusing on what what we have in the positive column. Uh, and I, and and that's one of the things I've always I I, I was talking with uh, uh, someone uh, last week uh, on this podcast, and uh, we were talking about Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you look at the eighteen twenty four election and the eighteen twenty eight election, and then you look at two thousand or mm -hmm. two thousand sixteen, or and you go, yeah. Things are bad, but, you know, things used to be, you know, there, there's almost this sense of it's always been bad and we've always made it to the other side. And, and, and that's cause for hope. It is. And if you think about, you know, to bring this back to George Washington, to the great leap of faith that was made when he, you know, not just agreed to, but, you know, facilitated the peaceful transfer of power at the end of his presidency, uh, when I saw the musical Hamilton, it was actually interesting. Uh, in the summer of, of 2016, uh, was, we were going into this very divisive presidential uh, uh, race. The moment that got the biggest standing ovation was was Washington's departure, and everybody just stood up and cheered. Yeah. And you know, I, I think the resonance of that and what he chose to do, as I said, a great leap of faith. You know, the, the much more conservative, you would say, thing to do would be to stay in power right, and keep right. things going. But well, and it's the, it's the Brutus moment <laughs> for is. America because he they would have a, they would have continued to elect him for as long as he lived. Mm -hmm. And uh, I and, mean, rightly so. <laughs> right. And, right. And they if he had said, yeah, we don't need to have any more elections, they would have said, that's fine. Yeah. And uh, instead, it's uh, he makes the same decision that Brutus does, which is I, I'm not going to be king. Mm -hmm. I'm you know, there's going to be a transition of power um, and it sets the tone for the next 250 years. As, and, and as much as we have struggled in these last, you know, um, you know, uh, it's it still what has happened recently has not come to define what America is yeah. because George Washington did that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I do want to ask one before we get to our quiz, I want to ask one question. And it's because uh, the title of your book just struck me as uh, really interesting. There is, as I'm sure you know, this constant debate over republic and democracy. And I, I just because you use the word democracy, and yet I know that you, you know, we are a republic. Yeah. We are a republic. You know that, obviously. Um, the great Ben Franklin, you know, what kind of government have you given us, Mr. Franklin, a republic, if you can, can keep, keep it. it. Yeah. Um, but 
talk to us about the the difference and why you chose democracy and 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 I'm hoping I'm expecting uh, from knowing you that that you have this understanding of you know the the relationship between democracy and republic that they're not they do not stand opposed to one another. No, and I mean democracy. You know, you can use sort of colloquially to get back to its its etymological roots as government by the people. Uh, and pure democracy, as practiced by the Athenians, is an extremely unwieldy system because you vote on everything. The people opine on decisions, great and small. The what executive there is 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 literally hamstrung and unable. To do much in terms of uh, in terms of, of setting policy, and for the Athenians, it, it proved completely unwieldy and collapsed. And they were tiny. Yeah, and then it was a little city. So if you tried to do that with a country the size of the United States, even as the original thirteen colonies, I think it just simply would be un, unworkable. And you need these these structures that go into a republic where you do elect directly your officials, but then they uh, they they are the ones who actually govern. And so, so I think the, you know, the Republican system as developed by the Romans, and that's what was adopted by the Florentines and the Dutch, and then eventually uh, you know, the British and the French, you know, that's, that is the, the best way we found to harness democracy into an effective uh, sort of civic structure. You. Uh, let's do our quiz. Okay. So this is uh, no, no homework necessary. Um, just a few not. questions. Yeah. Uh, excluding Washington and Lincoln, who's your favorite president? Probably Calvin Coolidge. Uh, I think he is little appreciated for the, you know, tremendous rigor and discipline he brought to being president. Uh, just very staunchly conservative in his principles, and then that guided all of his decisions. And he wasn't flashy, uh, famously silent cow, um, but I think I think he should be a real model uh, for a president. Um, last summer, we had Amity Schles, his biographer, mm -hmm. uh, here speaking to teachers and, and hoping to get her on the podcast. Uh, yeah, Amity's the wonderful, yeah. Yeah. If you had not chosen art history, uh, what, what, and, and, and what would your career be? Uh, you know, I've, I've pondered this. Uh, you know, it, it, it's such a privilege to be able to serve in, in government and be trusted with you know, positions of, of some responsibility and make some some decisions. So, I mean, govern, government is, is certainly a, a calling, but, you know, I, I think if I had my druthers and could do anything, I'd probably go into sports management. Oh, interesting. Uh, I'd, I'd love to do government relations for the Phillies. Uh, I've told them that repeatedly. They haven't taken me up I on it yet. I was going to say, they could, <laughs> they could probably use someone. But right now, probably the Sixers need more because well, the of the stadium. And then there's and the, the stadium. Yes, yeah, but, yes. but, but the, the reason I say that is, you know, these, these I mean, sports go back to time immemorial and are such a great source of joy for people. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, back to the Greeks. It's and, back to the Greeks. Yep. Uh, you know, horse races in, in Rome, but but this it's a, it's a wonderful sense of you know sort of civic coming together, community, common cause. Uh, so it, I, that would be a great deal of fun. Uh, what pet peeve annoys you the most? I, I, I have this question here because I have a million of them and I, one of them happened this morning on my way in is somebody <laughs> driving on 422 with their hazards on. I, be, I think because they were driving, you know, slightly slowly, but uh, it's one of the things, I don't know when this tradition started. I see it in rainstorms where yep, people put on their hazards that. while they're driving. And for me, a hazard means that you're stopped. And and so it's it's just one of those things that really annoys me. But. I'm a grammar stickler. Uh huh. And we have a lot of those on this show. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm shocked shocked to learn this. <laughs> you know that that you know my grammar isn't perfect, but I do try. And I think it you know one thing that that is concerning to me is how poorly most young people write at this point. It's so hard to hire somebody who can string a couple of sentences together, and you know, the, the resumes you get that are just loaded with errors. I, I, I throw them out. It, 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 
I mean, it's it's very hard to recover from that. And I know it makes you sound old fashioned and like a stick in the mud, but this is your opportunity to present yourself. Yeah. And if you do it in a slovenly fashion, people aren't going to take you seriously. So I would say poor grammar is I, my... I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, what's your favorite movie? There are a couple. Uh, one of my favorites is Tom Jones okay. uh, with Albert Finney uh, and Susanna York, which was one of my father's favorite movies. Uh, just a wonderful late 60s adaptation mm-hmm. of the Fielding novel. Uh, and and that that it, it that's the kind of movie I like, which is both historical in its subject matter, but very much of its own time. Right. And I would say along those lines, Clueless mm, with Alicia Silverstone, yeah. which is a play on Emma, <laughs> yes. uh, which is just so brilliantly and cleverly done. And you can enjoy the movie if you've never read Emma. But if you know Emma well, the movie is genius. Yeah, those so, ki- those kinds of, uh, you know, transliterations mm-hmm. of uh, of classic works into these modern um, uh, uh, modern movies is uh, when they're done well, they're incredible. Uh, let's see. Uh, what's one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? Uh, I feel like I'm an open book. (laughs) Uh, I think maybe the degree of my commitment to improving our environment. Mm -hmm. I think as a Republican and conservative, everybody assumes that you're just drill, baby, drill and don't care. But as a conservative, I mean, the word conservation is, is in in our in our title and i think you know getting back to maybe a, a teddy roosevelt kind of approach towards republicans being deeply interested in the environment and protective of it is might be surprising to yeah. some there is that that teddy roosevelt strain mm-hmm. um okay uh two more if you could meet just one historical person who would it be well, I mean, the, the name that springs to mind, which is pretty obvious, is Jesus. Mm, uh, sure. And But I am hopeful that that will, will happen to me in, in good time. Uh, I think George Washington mm-hmm. would be would be the non, non-biblical non character. I, I, you know, with, without him, it doesn't happen. Yeah. And I would, would really value the opportunity to know him as an in, individual. Yeah, I'm, I'm always uh, interested in these historic individuals where something changes because of them and how this one mm-hmm. person becomes, you know, this his, truly historic figure known throughout the world and particularly when it's for something positive as opposed to uh, the others. Final question that we ask everybody, bourbon or scotch? Bourbon. Excellent. <laughs> Um, thanks to our guest, uh, Victoria Coates, who is the new VP of the Davis Institute for National Security at the Heritage Foundation. I can't wait to have you back. I This was a great pleasure. Best part of my day. Excellent. Uh, I also want to thank our producers, Laura Kennedy and Sarah Rasmussen, and a special shout out to friend of the pod, Bill Franz, for his art design on the logo. Special thanks, too, to longtime Freedoms Foundation historic interpreter Bob Gleason for his contributions to the intro. And most of all, I want to thank you, our listeners. Please subscribe, follow, rate, and review George Washington Slept Here wherever you listen to podcasts, and tell your friends. To learn more about Freedoms Foundation at Valley Forge, check out our website at w www.freedomsfoundation.org and follow us on social media or email us at gwshpodcast at gmail.com with comments, questions, or suggestions. Thanks, and we'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.